Corey Ten Boom once said, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. We've been studying the life of David as we work our way through the book of 1 Samuel and perhaps as much or more than any other character in all of the Bible except for Jesus, maybe you could make a case for one or two others, David experienced some of the highest highs and the lowest lows. He went from living in the king's court, married to the king's daughter, in command of the king's armies, and loved by all the people, to running for his life away from the king's court, his wife taken from him, living in caves in the wilderness, hunted by the king like an animal while being betrayed by the people. David was equally acquainted with the joy of pleasure and plenty and the bitterness of sorrow and want. There's a tendency... For us, it's the same with David as we'll see, to give credit to God and to believe that he's with us when things are going our way, when times are good. And yet when things are not going our way, when times are hard, it is really easy to believe that it's because we've done something wrong and so somehow God is not with us. Well, listen, first of all, God is always with you. Regardless of your circumstances or how they came about, no matter how good or bad things may seem to be, God is with you. We don't have time in this message to read the volumes of Scripture passages that prove that God is always with you, but He is. His Word couldn't be any clearer on the matter. Secondly, when you tie God's favor and presence in your life to your circumstances... You're putting God in a box that cannot contain Him. Because His ability to work in your life on your behalf is in no way, shape, or form dependent upon or limited by your circumstances. Because God is bigger than your circumstances. He's beyond what you can see, and He's working in places you haven't been. Namely, your future. You understand, God is not limited by space and time the way that we are. God is outside of space and time, and He's sovereign over all of it. And so, before He created the heavens and the earth, He knew that He was going to create you. He also knew every single decision you were ever going to make, good, bad, or indifferent, including the decision that you would make to put your trust and faith in Him and to follow Him before He ever created the heavens and the earth. Right? Psalm 139, 16. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. And so when he created his plan for this world and everyone in it before any of it ever existed, he factored into that plan every single decision you would ever make, which is why the Apostle Paul was able to say, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose, Romans 8, 28. In other words, every moment of your life, the good days and the hard days, were accounted for in His plan for your life before your life ever existed. Which means whatever you see for yourself from wherever you're standing right now, no matter how good things are looking, no matter how hard things may be looking, whatever it is you see for yourself from where you're standing right now, you have to understand there is more to your story. Whatever you think your life is going to look like in the days ahead, there's more to your story than what you can see or predict or even imagine because God is always working in your life on your behalf and beyond your present circumstances. When Jesus was being persecuted and questioned by the religious Jews about healing people on the Sabbath, he said, my father's working until now and I'm working, John 5, 17. In other words, even on the days when you think there's absolutely nothing happening, even then, God is working on your behalf. And of course, it's hard when you can't see it, right? It's hard to take comfort in that knowledge sometimes when you don't know what or why or how he's working. And that's why we have stories like the one we're looking at today, because God's Word and the stories within its pages are not only meant to be informative, they're meant to be transformative. 
This isn't just a story about how God worked in David's life. It's a story about how God works in the lives of his people then and now. Even when we can't see it or predict it or even imagine it. So let's jump back into the story where we left off last time and get a glimpse into the work of God on behalf of his people, even when it doesn't seem like he's working at all. First Samuel chapter 27, we'll begin with the first four verses. Then David said in his heart, Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me than, I, than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. So David arose and went over, he and the 600 men who were with him, to Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. And David lived with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail of Carmel, Nabal's widow. And when it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer sought him. So David has finally had enough of being hunted like an animal for doing nothing wrong. Remember, David and his men had all their families with them, which was most certainly uh, taking a toll, right? This, this time period where they're in the wilderness trying to survive. It's one thing to go through something really difficult, but to watch your family suffer is a whole different level of hardship. And so David says enough is enough, and it's interesting what's going through his mind. Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. Forget the promises of God. All of what he's been told and anointed for and that, that has been uh, confirmed in his life over and over again. Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. In other words, because of my circumstances, the very best thing that I can hope for is to live with my sworn enemies. And so David, along with his troops and their families, go on to Gath, some 25 miles northwest of the desert of Ziph. And of course, Achish, a Philistine king, welcomes David with open arms because David is an infamous outlaw of Israel. And Achish knows it. In fact, he'd been coordinating his attacks on the Israelites at the times when Saul would go out into the wilderness with thousands of his very best soldiers to hunt David, as we saw back in chapter 23. And so for Achish... It's the old saying, my enemy's enemy is my friend. And for David, as far as he's concerned, living with the Philistines is the best he can hope for in order to survive and keep his family out of harm's way. And of course, David was chosen by God and anointed by Samuel as king of Israel. His future couldn't have been any brighter. The promises of God for David's life couldn't have been any better. And yet his present circumstances couldn't be much worse. David was losing hope. Now, I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. Those are the words of a man who's losing faith in the promises of God for his life. After all this time, after doing nothing against Saul, in fact, after honoring Saul time and again, taking care of David's own 600 men and their families in the wilderness, after blessing all the people around him, even strangers all along the way, and staying faithful and true to God through it all. His circumstances have gone from bad to worse. And so as far as David was concerned, the best he could hope for was to go to a foreign land in a foreign culture where their foreign religion and pagan gods and eke out an existence surrounded by the mortal enemies that he's been battling against most of his adult life in the hope that Saul would finally stop pursuing him. And it works. Saul breaks off his pursuit of David. This was everything David had hoped it would be, a respite from the constant turmoil David had been facing for so long at the hands of Saul. And yet there was so much more going on than just David surviving his difficult circumstances. So much more that God was doing in and through David's circumstances on David's behalf that David couldn't see, which is the whole point and the lesson that David had to learn. And of course, it's the lesson we need to learn in our own difficult circumstances when tomorrow is uncertain and the future unknown. Because listen, what God is doing in your life isn't always what it seems. There was far more happening in this story than meets the eye. David couldn't see, predict, or even imagine what God was doing on his behalf at this point in his life. He was just trying to keep himself and his family and those with him alive. 
And yet all the while, God was working, doing far more than just keeping David alive. As we're going to see, he was using David's circumstances to provide tremendous blessings and resources and prosperity for David and his family, also for his men and for their families and for God's people for generations to come while at the same time accomplishing his purposes for his people through David and more specifically through David's highly undesirable circumstances while living with the Philistines, which will all become clear as we continue in this story. Okay, the, the point is, what God is doing in your life isn't always what it seems. And it certainly cannot be judged by your circumstances alone. So don't Judge God's faithfulness based on the favorability of your circumstances because even though your circumstances constantly change, God's faithfulness never changes. The fact is, as bad as David's circumstances appeared to be, David was right where God wanted him and he was about to accomplish through David and those circumstances what Saul and so many others before him refused to do. And in the process, David would be rewarded far beyond what he could see or predict or even imagine. Okay, when your circumstances are not what you want them to be, don't lose hope. Don't despair because even though you can't feel God with you or see him working for you, that doesn't mean he isn't with you and isn't working on your behalf because God is always with you and he's always working on your behalf. The same God who is at work in David's life in this story, is working in your life today, whether you can see it or not. Through all of the twists and turns, the hardships and heartaches, the, the long days of waiting and wondering why you're going through what you're going through. Listen, even through your own brokenness, what may seem to be the most irreconcilable circumstances, God is always, always always working on your behalf in every situation, through every hurt, and even in those times of desperation, he's working to your ultimate good. Again, Paul said, for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called to his, according to his purpose. Notice he doesn't say, for those who love God, all pleasant things work together for good, or all healthy things work together for good, or all successful things work together for good. No, he says all things work together for good. In other words, for those who love God, meaning his people, he's working all aspects of our lives, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He's working all of it together, ultimately for our good. It's part of his plan for your life before your life existed. And interestingly enough, it's exactly what we find in this story about David. Everything that David saw as a deficit in his life, God saw as an asset. Because those heartaches and hardships and seemingly irreconcilable circumstances in David's life were the very means through which God brought blessing and provision and restoration in David's life. To the point that the joy and the blessing and the relationships that David enjoyed in the latter part of his life were infinitely greater than anything he could have ever seen or predicted or imagined in the earlier part of his life. But to get there, to get to the place where David was able to realize the fullness of all that God had for him, to get there he had to travel through all of the things that God had planned for him. Not just all the pleasant things or healthy things or successful things, okay? There, there are no shortcuts to becoming what God created you to be. You have to travel through all of the things that in the end get you where you're supposed to be. You can't skip a, a step or two or ten and expect to end up in the same place that you would when you go through all of the things that he intends for you to go through, right? To, to bake a delicious cake. In fact, somebody here made me a cheesecake last week. Oh, my goodness. Changed my life. To bake a delicious cake, a wonderfully sweet and beautifully decorated cake, you have to include all of the ingredients required to end up with that kind of cake, right? And yet some of the individual parts by themselves are not sweet or beautiful at all. No one would enjoy eating a bowl of raw flour by itself. But you have to have flour to create that masterpiece of a cake. Raw eggs are not particularly pleasant to look at or to consume, but you need them for that cake to turn out the way it's supposed to. 
See, there are individual ingredients in making a wonderful cake that are by themselves bitter or even harsh. But when combined with all of the other things in that recipe, the end result is far better than what you started with. And yet you can't leave out the unpleasant parts and expect to end up with the same result. God is constantly working all things in your life together for good. For good, because he knows all of the things that must be combined in your life to create the masterpiece that your life is intended to be. Okay, there's always more to your story than what you can see. So just keep that in mind the next time you're facing difficult circumstances. So often what we view as deficits in our lives, God actually sees as assets as he combines all of it together to make something beautiful, even when you can't see it or predict it or even imagine it from where you're standing right now. Because what God is doing in your life isn't always what it seems. Chuck Swindoll, great preacher, said, We are all faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. Let's keep reading, verses 5 through 7. Then David said to Akish, If I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be given me in one of the country towns that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So that day Achish gave him Ziklag. Therefore Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. And the number of days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. So David asked the Philistine king for some land where he and his people could dwell. And more specifically, he asked for land outside of the royal city. Of course, David frames his request from a position of humility, like he's not deserving to live in such a prestigious place among the Philistines, when in reality, David probably wanted to distance himself uh, from Achish in order to try and rebuild his relationship with the Israelites without Achish knowing, as we'll see. And asking a vassal king for land, by the way, was a common feudal practice in antiquity. So being convinced of David's irreconcilable differences with Israel and its king, Akish is all too happy to give David some land far from the city where the Philistine people would be less apt to resent the king uh, for keeping David around when you consider David's overwhelming military victories over them in the past. So Akish gives David Ziklag, about 25 miles southwest of Gath, very close to the southernmost border of Israel. In fact, Ziklag was technically territory that had been assigned to both the tribe of Simeon in Joshua 19.5 and Judah in Joshua 15.31. But the Israelites had never conquered it as they were commanded to do on their conquest of Canaan, which we'll come back to. So David, in his retreat from Saul, settles in Ziklag, one of the results being that Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. In other words, because of David's crummy circumstances, Land that God had given to the Israelites that they never had possessed was now permanently in their possession. You see, what God is doing in your life is never just about you. Your story is never just about you. Because you're, you're one part of an entire body, which means whether you like it or not, you're connected and inseparably bound to the other members of the body. And so everything you would do, you do affects someone else. And everything that God is doing in your life affects someone else. Which means there's always more to your story than simply how your circumstances are affecting you personally. And listen, it's not that, uh, that God doesn't care about how your circumstances affect you personally, because He does care. In fact, He cares deeply and profoundly. He cares about every single detail of your life. But he also cares about all the other parts of the body, all the other people who are affected by every detail of your life as well. There's there's no way David could have known the day he moved to Ziklag the long-lasting effect that his presence there would have on generations of Israelites after him. But remember, God is always working beyond what you can see or predict or even imagine. And not just for you, but for those you're connected to. Right? There are few things as profoundly influential in our lives as family. Whether that influence is positive or negative, the effects of family in our upbringing reverberate throughout the rest of our lives. And so, for instance, 
the degree to which a person is or, or is not nurtured and cared for and encouraged within a family, uh, the existence of or absence of accountability between family members, the use of or lack of discipline, uh, the amount or lack of affirmation that one receives as a member of that family. All of those uh, family dynamics have tremendous influence in our lives, one way or the other. In fact, uh, a Barna study said nearly two-thirds of Americans polled said that family was the number one factor in their lives in determining their identity. Being an American was second, and the religious faith was ranked third. Okay, the majority of people carry the effects of their family influences with them throughout their lives to one degree or another, to the point that our lives are often shaped by those relationships. Well, then along comes Jesus, who not only came to show us the way to the next life, but he also came to show us how to live in this one. And so he invited us to become members of his family, his spiritual family, which it turns out is vitally important and formative in shaping who we become because we are, as members of his body, eternally connected one to the other, which is why the Apostle Paul said, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together, 1 Corinthians 12, 26, because what God is doing in your life through your circumstances, whether they're good or bad, that all affects other people. And here's the point. You have a responsibility to always consider how your choices, your decisions, especially when facing difficult circumstances, you have a responsibility to always consider the effect those decisions will have on the people you're connected to. Because your story is never just about you. It's about you and every other person that God has put in your life. And you can't ignore that. You can't ignore that. Not if you want to truly understand what God is up to in your life. Because your story is always a part of someone else's story. And so the next time you find yourself in a difficult spot, listen, before you look for the closest exit from those circumstances, first ask God, why have you brought me here? Because it may just be you're there to fight through something for someone else, to take ground for someone else to occupy, to be a blessing to someone who cannot do what you do, who cannot provide what you provide. Okay, there's always more to your story than just how it's affecting you. And so if you don't want to miss out on all that God is doing in your life, then pay attention to what he's doing in other people's lives through yours. G.K. Chesterton once said, The true soldier fights not because he hates what is in front of him, but because he loves what is behind him. Let's finish the story for today. Verse 8 to the end of the chapter. Now David and his men went up and made raids against the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites, for these were the inhabitants of the land from of old as far as sure to the land of Egypt. And David would strike the land and would leave neither man nor woman alive, but would take away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the garments, and come back to Achish. When Achish asked, where have you made a raid today? David would say, against the Negev of Judah, or against the, Neg the Negev of the Jeremielites, or against the Negev of the Kenites. And David would leave neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, thinking lest they should tell about us and say. So David has done. Such was his custom all the while he lived in the country of the Philistines. And Achish trusted David, thinking he's made himself an utter stench to his people Israel, therefore he shall always be my servant. The Philistines weren't the sharpest tools in the box. Uh, so after moving into Ziklag with his family and his 600 men and their families, David knows that they're safely out of reach of Saul. But he also knows that he has to provide for all these people in this new rugged and largely undeveloped territory. And so he promptly begins raiding Canaanite cities and towns nearby, killing everyone in the process, keeping the spoils of war as provisions for his people, and yet always careful to share his bounty with the Kish, the Philistine king, who asks David what cities he's been raiding. So David not only gives the Kish the names of Israelite, controlled territories, which was plausible enough to believe because, again, Ziklag was close to uh, Israel's southern border. But he also kills everybody, every human soul in the process in those towns and cities, the ones he was actually 
raiding, which were not Israelite controlled. They were Canaanite cities, which for David's part, uh, that simply served a very practical purpose to keep anyone from being able to report to Achish that David was actually attacking Canaanite territories, not Israelite territories. And right, and, and Achish buys it hook, line, and sinker. And yet there's, there's far more to the story, far more here than meets the eye, because even in what seems to be a cruel and ungodly way for David to obtain the provisions he and his men and their families need, God has a greater purpose in it as he uses David and these violent circumstances to accomplish his purposes for the promised land all the way back from the time of Moses. Because from the beginning of their exodus from Egypt through their journey to the promised land where the, uh, there was a Torah mandate in the law, the Mosaic law, a very specific military assignment under the law to conquer the promised land, applying the Karim principle in the process. We talked about this. If you were here all the way back in chapter 14, the Hebrew term Karim, or what is referred to as the Karim principle, was very familiar to the Hebrew people. It's a word we don't really have a very good equivalent for in our modern English language, but it's an ancient term that referred to a very special action of setting something apart permanently as property of God. To put something under Karim was to radically devote that person or place or thing, whatever it was, to the Lord, either for service or for destruction. So the Karim principle was like an all or nothing proposition. And so when entire cities or entire populations were placed under Karim, that usually involved the complete annihilation of that city and its people, which, by the way, wasn't unique to the Israelites in the Mesha steel or the Moabite stone located in modern-day Jordan. There are 9th century inscriptions that describe King Mesha of Moab capturing Israelite cities and putting them under Karim, total destruction in order to honor the Moabite god Chemish. The point being, the principle of Karim was widely understood in the ancient Near East by many people, so that this order uh, by God to Moses, then on to Joshua, then on to Samuel, then on to Saul, then on to the Israelites, was widely understood. And of course, I know that offends our modern sensibilities and sensitivities, but you have to understand this Karim principle was employed by God to prevent His chosen people from experiencing precisely what they ended up experiencing throughout their history because they failed to follow through with Karim over their enemies. Okay, the people in and around Canaan were deeply, profoundly wicked people. You can read about all the gory details in Leviticus 18, 6 through 30, also Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 14, if you like. In fact, we have ancient apocryphal writings. The 2nd century B.C. wisdom of Solomon is one example, which together with biblical scripture details Canaanite practices of witchcraft, incest, bestiality, child sacrifice by burning the children alive and then cannibalizing their bodies and drinking the blood of those innocent children, not to mention just about every other kind of sexual deviation you do not want to imagine. And that's just scratching the surface. That is to name a few of the Canaanites' favorite pastimes. When you add the depravity of these pagan cultures with the fact that the Amalekites, one of David's targets here in our story, were unrelentingly brutal toward the Israelites for centuries. Is it any wonder God didn't want His chosen people mixing their Hebrew culture with the pagan cultures around them? And so God commands His people to destroy the inhabitants of Canaan from Moses on to Saul. And yet one after the other, after the other, after the other, failed to fully do so. Now here's where it gets interesting. Because all three of these groups, the Geshurites, Gerzites, and Amalekites, in the story that David was attacking and killing everyone, they were all under the ban or the Karim command of the Torah in Deuteronomy 20, 16, and 17, meaning none of them were to be spared by the Israelites in warfare from the original command to Moses. So here is David, who's simply trying, as far as he's concerned, to provide for himself and his people without being caught by the Philistine king, and yet he's actually fulfilling the ancient law that none of the Israelite rulers before him were willing to do by continuing the conquest of Canaan, the way it was supposed to be done from the beginning. That's why he does not incur blood guilt on himself or on his men in the process, because even though David is serving his own purpose through these unpleasant circumstances, God is using those very same circumstances in David's life to accomplish his own purposes, clearly laid out before his people from long ago. 
So look, as much as God will use your difficult circumstances in your life to provide for you, and He will in ways that you cannot see or predict or even imagine, there's always more to the story because what God is doing in your life always serves His purposes. No matter what is happening in your life, you can rest assured that God has a purpose for it of His own. Because this journey that you're on as a Christian, listen, it's ultimately about Jesus Christ and His purpose for your life, which means at times in your life, if you're truly following Christ, He will lead you places you probably don't want to go. That's okay. Because you can't always see or predict or even imagine where that journey is meant to lead you. I don't think the Apostle Paul wanted to be beaten any more than Jesus wanted to be crucified or John the Baptist wanted to be beheaded any more than we want to be led into difficult circumstances today. But sometimes the Spirit of Christ leads us into places we do not want to go. Why? For our good and for His glory. And it is in those difficult circumstances that you have to decide whether or not you're going to submit to the leading of the Spirit of Christ in your life or abandon the journey He has you on, as difficult as it may be at times. Because look, sometimes He's going to lead you to love people who will never love you back. I guarantee it. Sometimes He's going to lead you to give more than you want to give. Sometimes He's going to lead you to serve where you don't feel like serving. Sometimes He's going to lead you to risk what you never thought you'd have to. Sometimes He's going to lead you to let go of something you do not want to give up. Sometimes He's going to lead you to lay everything on the line for Him. And in those most challenging circumstances, you're going to be confronted with the reality that this journey you're on is ultimately about His purposes being accomplished in your life for your good and for His glory. Right? David's conquest of these Canaanite territories provided tremendous blessings for him and his family and his people, but it also brought great glory to God as his ancient commands were finally being fulfilled, whether David realized it or not. So look, the next time you're facing something truly difficult, something that is testing your limits, just remember, there's always a purpose a God-given purpose beyond what you can see or predict or even imagine. And that purpose is always, it is always for your good and for His glory. So don't miss it just because it's hard sometimes. A.W. Tozer said, God is looking for those with whom He can do the impossible. What a pity that we plan only the things we can do by ourselves. Okay, when things are not going your way, when times are hard, I know it's really easy to lose perspective. I know that better than anyone. To believe that the hard things are happening to us because we've done something wrong or, or that somehow God's not with us. And yet when you begin to understand and accept that God has a purpose in everything you ever have to walk through in this life, whether you helped create those circumstances or not, then you'll begin to see your circumstances in a whole new light. Because first of all, God is absolutely with you every single step of the way. And secondly, He has a purpose in everything, a great purpose for your good and for His glory. So don't put God in a box. Don't limit in your own heart and mind what He's able to do in you and through you based on your circumstances. Because listen, God's ability to work in your life on your behalf is in no way, shape, or form dependent upon or limited by your circumstances, no matter how hard they may be. Why? Because God is bigger than your circumstances. He's beyond what you can see, and He's working in places you haven't been, namely your future. So even when you can't see it, or predict it, or even imagine it, you can believe it. That there's more to your story, because He loves you, and He's for you. And He's always working. He is always working. 
for your good. Let's pray.